Welcome to First English Lutheran Church of Dorset. So thankful and, and joyful that you have been able to join us this morning for worship, that you're part of our family this morning watching worship. A few things about our church, just so you know. We are a confessional Lutheran church. What we believe, teach, and confess is that the Bible is the inspired and inerrant word of God, free from error, completely God's word in every sense. We also believe that we don't interpret the Bible. Scripture interprets Scripture. We learn God's word, and in places, he teaches us what his word means as we follow along and stay in his word. We also believe every bit of what Scripture teaches about who we are as fallen human beings. When Adam and Eve sinned and brought sin into the world, it means every person is conceived and born sinful and in need, desperate need of only what Christ did for us in his death and resurrection, his perfect life in our place. We believe in six days of creation. We believe what the Bible says. The earth was created in six normal days, not billions and millions of years ago. We don't believe in evolution because it's not what God teaches. We believe in the order of creation. We believe that Adam was created first and then Eve. We don't believe this makes men and women unequal in any way. We just believe that God has a plan, a vocation for each of us in our place, who we are as men and women. And we believe that Christ's true body and blood are present in the sacrament, not symbolically, not in some way that means his body and blood. Truly, he gives us his body and blood to eat and to drink for the forgiveness of sins and for the strengthening of our faith. We also hold to the fact that baptism means what the Lord says it is. When we're baptized into Christ, we are baptized into his death and resurrection. It truly happened. We died with Christ and we rose again with him. And each and every day that we wake to remember our baptism, we are leading the repentant life that our Lord calls us to. As Luther says in the very first of the 95 Theses, when our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ says repent, he wills the entire life of a Christian be one of repentance. We also believe, so importantly, that God's word actually does what it says. We're sacramental Christians. When we hear his word proclaimed, when his gospel promises are delivered, when we hear his word taught to us and explained, as you will shortly in the sermon throughout all of the liturgy, we know that the Lord is working through us, through his word, delivering his gifts giving us what he says, forgiving us and giving us eternal life. So again, welcome to worship here at First English Lutheran Church. God bless your day in Christ. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Several prayers, including one that's very close to home. Carrie's mom went to heaven on Friday morning about 1.50 in the morning after struggling with pneumonia for a couple days. So Carrie and I will be, and the boys, will be leaving on Wednesday to drive down to Oklahoma for the funeral. So everything this week will be canceled. So no Wednesday events, no Thursday events, no Friday events, okay? Also, Janet Miller is in the hospital with COVID. Uh, I talked to her last night and she sounded really all things considered, pretty good. She's getting taken care of. She was home all week by herself, not eating, not taking care of things, and got pretty weak. So hopefully, Lord willing, she'll be okay. Um, John and Bonnie are getting over COVID, and my guess is COVID is sweeping through our congregation. It's everywhere. I mean, it just it just is. Joni is in a bed down in New York Mills, unresponsive. Probably won't be with us very much longer, so I'm going to try to sneak down after Bible study um, and go see her if they'll let me in, because um, when they ask me if I've been around people that have COVID, I'm going to have to say, yeah, a ton of them, so hopefully they'll allow me to go in and have a prayer with her, but please keep her in your prayers. Her faith is strong. She's ready to go to heaven. Um, we have all the folks on our prayer list that we continue to, to pray for, um, Wayne and Karen and Wayne and and Karen and Mark and Colin and Ryan and Bev and Jeff and Craig and Cheryl and all those I mentioned and all those that we named before the Lord in our hearts. So 
We take these prayers to him knowing he hears and answers them. And we begin this morning by singing our opening hymn, 904, Blessed Jesus at Your Word. Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Dear friends, upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We now join together in reading our intro for this third Sunday after Epiphany, printed in your service bulletin in service. You will arise and have pity on Zion. It is time to favor her. The appointed time has come. Let this be recorded for the generation to come. 
so that the people yet to be created may praise the Lord. That he looked down from his holy height. From heaven the Lord looked at the earth. To hear the groans of the prisoners. To set free those who were doomed to die. That they may declare in Zion the name of the Lord. And in Jerusalem his praise. When peoples gather together. And in kingdoms to worship the Lord. Moves us, 
This truth ought to urge everyone to the word of God, because thereby the devil is put to flight and driven away. A reading from our Lutheran Confessions. Anyone who wants to can join in.
and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle for this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each and one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now, if you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Now, excuse me. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts. This too is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the fourth chapter. Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives, recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, 
do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut for up for three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman, the, the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of a hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. This is the gospel of our Lord. <coughs>
Dear friends, grace, peace, and mercy be yours this morning and always from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning, if you will, is the third commandment. What is the third commandment? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. <laughs> what does this mean? We should fear and love God so we do not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. Sort of a motto in our house is we don't just have to go to church. We get to go to church. I think it's a truism. If you think about relationships with children, there's a couple of things, at least in my experience as a parent, and it's probably very typical. Two things I think you could say are true, even truisms. Don't have to wake up the kids on Christmas morning. <laughs> or really in our house, Easter morning, because they get a look for candy, right? But, but you have to force like crazy to get kids to take their medicine. I remember as a kid growing up in a pharmacist family, I hated it. The only time it did, my parents didn't have to force me to take my medicine was when I got that Keflex syrup that tasted like bubble gum. Otherwise, no way, get it away from me, right? What do our readings for this morning have to teach us about the third commandment? Actually, a lot. They're wonderful. In Nehemiah, we just don't get Nehemiah very often. Nehemiah chapter 8, the whole book of Nehemiah, if you know the history of Judah, of God's people, People that, that, the people living in Jerusalem, the people living in the southern kingdom, they'd been in exile for 70 years, just as God had promised. They'd been away so long that many of them had forgotten about Jerusalem. If you know from the book of Esther, that many of them had sort of, not, not sort of, had in many ways become part of the Persian culture that was their culture now. But there were still those that held out for God's promise to be true, to return to Jerusalem. Nehemiah, the high priest, was one of those. And Nehemiah, this, this whole book is about finally King Xerxes giving permission through all the events that happened all through the book of Esther, giving permission to those living in exile and you know, I, I have this theme. You're going to be hearing about this theme from me for the whole year, about living in exile. Very, very pertinent, very relevant to our circumstances today. But the people living in exile, many of them, they wanted to go home. And King Xerxes finally gave permission for them to go back to Jerusalem. And the events that you have here, it's amazing. These are the events of the worship service, the church service that took place after they rebuilt the wall around Jerusalem and had the temple up and functioning again. And they had a worship service. They praised God. And they wanted to be there. They want, did you catch the length of time? Did you guys catch the length of time that this church service lasted? For well over six hours. For a good part of the day. And for much of it, the people were standing. And they had the readings. And Nehemiah was reading. And they had people in the crowd that were priests. And, and people that would have been like the scribes. And the, the, the people that were religious leaders. Who were helping give little mini sermons as they read the text. So that the people could understand it. And the people were loving it. They couldn't get enough. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine a six-hour church service or an eight-hour church service where not only were you not looking at your watch every ten minutes and going, when is he going to wrap this up? I've got things to do. There's football on the television this afternoon. I want to go ice fishing. I've got a million things to do. I've got laundry. Get you ready for tomorrow. None of that was going on. They were so happy to be there hearing God's word because they had been through so much and they saw 
what God had done in their lives and how God had kept his promise, at least the, the temporal part of the promise, which pointed to much greater things. But God had kept that promise and brought them back to Jerusalem and the temple where God promised to be for his people was up and running again. And they were gathered around his word and they were so happy. You know, this reminds us of the third commandment, doesn't it? What does this mean? We should fear and love God so we not only don't despise preaching his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. These dear people, having been through everything they were, they couldn't get enough. They couldn't get enough. It reminds me a little bit of 9-11, where for what, about three weeks after 9-11, churches were full. People went back to hear God's word because they felt the need for it. But then it just sort of stopped. President Bush, I guess meaning well, but I always remember this, told people to get back to normal. Just go back to normal. Now, people didn't need to get back to normal. They needed to stay where they were at. They needed to see their need for God's word. They needed to be in church. They needed to rejoice in God's word and hear those promises. Because as Luther says, in the large catechism, you can never, ever be around God's word and spend time meditating on it, spend time reading it, spend time thinking about it without it bestowing understanding and strengthening faith and showing you God's will for your lives. Okay? That's where the people of Nehemiah were at. They were just, I mean, it was all, they couldn't get enough of God's word. Well, then things sort of went dark for about 500 years. You know, people were there, they were doing their thing. Culture was doing its thing too. You notice how Luther said in the large catechism, the devil's always at work. He's always at work. Wherever God's word is not present, the devil is always there working through the culture, through the world, through our fallen flesh to try to get us to take our eyes off of God's word, to focus on different things. For 500 years, they got back. They were doing their thing in Jerusalem. Again, many faithful people, but a lot happened. No prophecies for about 500 years. Really, at the end of the Old Testament prophecies we have in the Bible, about 500 years took place without any new word of God. But they were left with the promise. The promise God had given from the beginning, from the fall, throughout all of the Old Testament, that this promise about restoring Jerusalem wasn't just about the location of Jerusalem. It was partly about that, but it was primarily about the Messiah coming, the one who would come, the one who would come and bring the year of the Lord's favor. Now fast forward, if you will, to our gospel reading for this morning. Jesus, the Son of God, who had just been anointed in the Jordan River, by the Holy Spirit for all the people to see as the second Adam, we talked about that a couple weeks ago, anointed to be the Messiah, anointed to be the one that would take people's sins on himself, their substitute, and make his way to the cross. He had then just gone out into the wilderness, and we're going to talk about that in a couple weeks when Lent starts, where he had kept pure the, the will of God in the face of the devil's temptations, as Adam had failed to do. He had kept strong. He had not sinned when tempted by the Lord. And now this anointed Lord and Savior, this anointed Christ, shows up in Nazareth. And by the way, if anybody ever tries to tell you that Jesus didn't go to church and church isn't important, they don't know what they're talking about. Jesus was always in church. Synagogue was church. Here's a perfect example. On the Sabbath day, Jesus, as was his custom, was in church and they had readings for the day just like we do because our liturgy is nothing but an extension of the same kind of church Jesus had, only we now have the New Testament, the fulfillment of his coming. So Jesus goes to Nazareth, and you can almost see the scene. Here's this big shot homeboy coming back to Nazareth. You know, they certainly had heard about him, certainly had heard things about him, and initially the reception's wonderful. It's almost like celebrity coming back to town. 
You know, you know how that is whenever you hear about somebody related to a celebrity. You know, and if they'll be around a celebrity, it's like big, right? You know, Shepard's girlfriend is related to what, what's the guy's name, Carrie? John Bernthal. He's an actor, so that's always big news in our family. Shepard's girl. You know, you know how we are. We're that way, right? Oh, somebody knows that celebrity. Jesus came back to Nazareth, and at first it was big news because he was sort of a celebrity. But then he got up and he started reading from the assigned reading for that day, from the Isaiah text, chapter 61. And it all started to fall apart. Now they held their manners for a while, but it all started to go back. Because remember, the world, the devil, and our sinful nature is always working. It's always trying to divide. It's always trying to separate us from God's word and promise, make us think about things that aren't important, separate us, cause problems with each other. And Jesus stands up, reads that wonderful text from Isaiah 61, a messianic text that says that God will be sending his son, the Messiah, into the world to preach good news to the poor, to lift up the brokenhearted, to heal the lame, to give sight to the blind, to give hearing to the deaf, to proclaim the jubilee year, the year of the Lord's favor. They all knew what that meant. Every decent catechized Jew understood that was about the Messiah coming. So here, hometown homie boy, Jesus stands up, reads from the script, the Isaiah script, but he says it in a way, it says, this hearing, what you just heard me read, here's the part he adds. This has all come true in your hearing. This has all been fulfilled in your listening. In other words, Plain as the nose on your face, Jesus says, I'm the fulfillment of all of this. I'm the Messiah. I'm here to be your Savior. I'm here to rescue you, to bring you out of darkness, and to bring you into God's kingdom. And that's where it starts to go bad. Because homeboy had been around people. Homeboy was known as Joseph's son. And although he initially was a favored son, he went too far. Probably for the same reason that Mary and his earthly brothers and sisters had been going around saying, hey, Jesus, knock it off. You're making the family look bad. You're, you're acting full of yourself. You're, you're acting like you're a little off. Quit saying all this stuff. Well, now the people, there was rumbling. At first, it seems like they're putting on nice smiles. It's sort of like the person at the dinner table that first says the inappropriate comment and you sort of smile, right? You don't like it, but you sort of smile. That's what they were doing. Jesus had just said he's the Messiah. So at first, they okay, whatever. But then because Jesus is the Messiah, he knew their thoughts. He started pressing them on exactly what they were thinking. He started saying, oh, you guys don't like it, do you? You don't like it that I'm saying this. You're saying things like, physician, heal thyself. And, and then he points out, he points out God's real mission, his real kingdom, to send the Messiah into the world so the world would be saved through him. And he points out how Elijah went to a widow in Sidon. Not to the Jewish people. How, that's how God worked. And then he pointed out how Naaman the Syrian, in a time when leprosy was very abundant in Israel and lepers were considered outcasts, Jesus didn't heal, or, or God didn't come to heal Israelite lepers, he healed Naaman the Syrian in the waters of the Jordan River. In other words, Jesus was saying, you're the ones that should see me and know me, and I'm telling you who I am, but the things about you, the way the world has worked on your hearts, the things that the devil has done to make you think of yourselves as being better than others, and set apart from others, and all the way you look at things in this fallen world, you're not seeing me and you're in jeopardy of losing everything God sent me to bring you. And that was it. That was it. You know, no more polite smiles. No more, you know, this is our homeboy. This is our local guy, our hero. No, this was it. They tried to seize him and they literally wanted to kill him because they didn't want to hear any more of what he was saying. And they forced him out to the edge of town to try to throw him off a cliff. And Jesus, being God, simply walked through the crowd. Because his mission 
his purpose in coming had not yet been fulfilled. Why didn't they want to hear the word that he proclaimed? Why did the people in Nehemiah's day respond so wonderfully to the word? You hear that reading, their faults were proclaimed, the law and the gospel was given, they rejoiced, they had no problem hearing who they really were and in rejoicing in God's promise for them. But now Jesus in his own hometown proclaims that he is the fulfillment of all of it and they don't want to hear it. What causes us to close ourselves off from the truth of God's word? What causes us to metaphorically want to push Jesus over a cliff? In other words, not pay attention to the clear words and teachings that he's giving in Scripture, in his word. What causes us to turn a blind eye or a deaf ear to that particular teaching or this particular teaching and not want to pay attention to that or this or something we read or hear from Scripture? What causes that? What is the third commandment? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. What does this mean? We should fear and love God's words. We do not despise. We should fear and love God's. We do not despise preaching and His word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. What causes us? And again, I say this all the time. It always gets a chuckle, and I don't mean it to be funny, and I don't mean it to get a chuckle. What causes us to get upset when the worship service? approaches the hour and a half mark. What gets us a little bit uneasy when the hymn has eight stanzas? What causes us to hold so tightly to a schedule that God's word becomes inconvenient? What causes us to not want to hear particular teachings about ethics and morality that are inconsistent with the world's way of looking at things? What causes us to not want to be in Bible study? What causes us not to not want to do daily devotions with our family? What causes us to watch that show on television that we know darn well doesn't fit with our faith, but we like it? What causes us to do all these things and set aside God's word rather than being like the people in Nehemiah's day, the people returning to Jerusalem after all that heartache and all that hardship? What causes that if them to rejoice and us to say, oh, it's an hour and a half, better wrap it up? Well, let's look at the epistle. So Jesus, Jesus has come to declare unequivocally who he is, to say he is the one okay, that's come to lift us up, to heal us of our blindness, to give us hearing, to restore us, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, which again, without a half hour sermon on that, which would take too long, that's all about forgiveness in God's kingdom, about restoring everything to what it was before Adam and Eve messed up. That's what we have. And that's what the people in 1 Corinthians, the first generation of Christians, had. But yet they still managed to mess it up. That text is very interesting. It fits so perfectly with the other two. Because here St. Paul is saying, why do you come together and make little, make little sects and little, little groups in your churches and act like you're better than this, these people and you're part of this group over here. That's what they were doing. They were abusing the Lord's Supper. They were seeing each other differently. Jews who had become Christians were seeing Gentile Christians differently, looking down their noses at them, separating themselves into different groups, sort of the way Republicans and Democrats do, or liberals and conservatives, or whatever group you want to talk about. And Paul basically comes on, I'm paraphrasing, well, he comes on and says, you're part of the body of Christ. You want me to go back and read Luke 4 for you again? 
That Jesus is the one who came to bring you into his kingdom? To lift you up and restore everything? And now look at the way you're behaving. And so, again, why do, why do they behave that way? What caused them to look down their noses at some, think they're better than others? What caused them to ignore teachings of Paul and the other disciples? What caused them to act the way they did and disregard the clear teaching of God's word? St. Paul reminds them that when you're in Christ, you are one body. When you're in Christ, you're one. And picking up on fallen human nature, he says, you know, you want to think because you're a pretty face, you're impo more important than the big toe on somebody else's foot. You want to think because you have an ability that everybody else thinks is wonderful, you're more important than a person that has some ability that doesn't seem quite so grand and important in the world. You see, that's not how we think as Christians. We're all equally important. Every part of the body, whether it be the little toe or whether it be the eye, is equally important. And you can't say, oh, you're just a little toe, but I'm an eye. I'm a little more important than you are. Or, translate, you can't say, I'm a pastor, you're just a custodian. I'm more important to God's kingdom than you are. No, that's not how God's kingdom works. Here's the point of all this, and the point of the third commandment. How would you know any of this if you weren't in God's word? If you weren't in God's word, hearing the readings... Having a pastor teach it, spending time in daily devotion and Bible study, how would you know that you're even looking at things in a wrong way? How would you have God teach you these things if you weren't in his word, if you didn't remember the Sabbath day, if you didn't fear and love God so that you don't despise preaching in his word, think it's taking a little too long, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. So as Luther says, that word of God can bring you understanding and strengthen your faith and lift you up and show you how he would have you look at things for your own good out of love, not because he's some ridiculous ruler in the sky that just wants to be your boss, but he really knows what's best for us and what's best for everyone. This is a marvelous text for epiphany. I thought of this. I was thinking about the word for epiphany. You know what the word epiphany means? If you look it up in Merriam-Webster's dictionary, the moment when you suddenly see or understand something in a new or clear way. That's what happens whenever you spend time in God's word. Whenever you remember the Sabbath day. Whenever you gladly hear and learn his word and are in his word. I started with the truism earlier, you know, you don't have to wake up kids on Christmas morning. You do have to stay on them about taking their medicine, right? But here's an epiphany for epiphany. When we're in God's word, when we're spending time in his word, when we're letting the Holy Spirit work through his word and reveal truth to us, it starts to become very apparent. It starts to become a wonderful, obvious thing. We don't just have to go to church. We get to go to church. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds forever in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.
whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God of Zion, we give you thanks that you have arisen to show pity on our fallen world, setting us free from our sin and death. In Christ, the appointed time of favor, the year of the Lord's favor, has come for all who belong to him. Cause your name to be declared among all peoples, that your grace may not be rejected in our time, but received with delight and joy in every place. Lord, in your mercy, hear us prayer. O Lord, your people in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah return to your word with attentive ears. Give us eagerness to hear your word with understanding, that our days may be sanctified and your commandments put into practice among us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Father, you have arranged us as members of the one body in Christ Jesus. Free us from jealousy or contempt toward our fellow Christians. Help us to look at all things through the lens you have given us, through the Holy Spirit and your word. Lead us to bestow honor on our weaker brothers, to suffer and rejoice together, and to serve in harmony as those baptized in one spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, bless all families and homes that one generation may tell the next the wonderful works of God in Christ Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, O oh God of wisdom and courage, to all who govern our communities, we, or for all who govern our communities, we pray that they may lead well, following your will rather than man's whims and man's fallen ideas. Grant us willingness to support them with our prayers and our encouragement. Lord, in your mercy, gracious and compassionate Lord, comfort those who mourn, especially Carrie and her family, all of us who miss Judy and, and know that she has gone to be with you in heaven, with Daryl and his family. As our great physician, mend the bodies and uplift the spirits of all in need, especially we pray for Bonnie and Janet and John, for Wayne, Karen, Joan, Wayne, Karen, Mark, Colin, Ryan, Bev, Jeff, Craig, Cheryl, and all those we now name before you, Lord, in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, your Son has come with favor to deliver us, and in his blessed sacrament, the sacrament of his true body and blood, he brings cleansing and strength. Give faith to us all that we should not despise our Savior and his holy communion. Do not pass through us and go away as at Nazareth, but dwell among us, Lord, graciously. Lord, in your mercy, all this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Please be seated as we sing our closing hymn, 585. 
Lord Jesus Christ with us abide. <laughs> yourself. Well, greet one another as brothers and sisters in the Lord. We'll see you in the social hall for some goodies and then Bible study. God bless everybody.